If someone you loved went missing, what lengths would you go to in order to find them? And if a stranger was in trouble, would you risk your own safety to help them? Deadly deep dives. This video is intended for educational and documentary purposes. The content within this video contains themes that some individuals may consider triggering, offensive, or disturbing. The intent is not to disrespect viewers or any individual spoken about herein. Viewer discretion is advised. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. It's Kimberlea, nice to meet you if you've never been here before. Something I wanted to also mention before we get started is that I do have a podcast it is in collaboration with Celeb Magazine, and there is an app you can get. I will link it below, and you can listen to some exclusive episodes and some that you've already heard here. I do an exclusive maybe every few weeks, so if you're interested, don't forget to check that out. Before I get in, we do have a sponsor today, which is so important to me. They're helping me provide these videos to you, so all I ask is you just give me a little of your time to let me tell you about them. And a lot of us are trying to get back on track from the hit that we took in 2020, and that's why I chose PDS Debt as our sponsor today. And they are giving you a chance to get a free debt analysis and copy of your credit report just for doing this 30 second online debt assessment. It's super easy. It's at pdsdebt.com slash Kim. It's P-D-S-D-E-B-T dot com slash Kim, K-I-M. I'm gonna leave it here on the screen so you can see it. You can see that I'm doing it right here. I thought this would be a great sponsor because I don't use credit cards anymore. I learned from when I was in college and I went into really bad debt and PDS Debt provides the solution that I used to become debt free. So if you charged gifts to your credit card or you wanna make a big purchase, you wanna track your credit score, you should. They will give you a full breakdown of all the interest you shouldn't be paying each month Plus, they'll give you multiple options to get rid of it, especially if you are looking for a solution for paying down your debt and you have like multiple credit cards and you're trying to keep track of all your minimum payments and things like that. I know I'm not the only one that's gone through this because the average American with credit cards or personal loan debt over 5,000 ends up paying back two and a half times what they originally spent. Anyone that has over $5,000 in debt qualifies for the PDS debt solutions and there's no minimum credit score. PDS Debt is there to help anyone struggling with your credit cards, your personal loans, your medical bills, which is a big one right now. And what they do is they customize your plan and they roll all of your payments into one low zero interest monthly payment. A lot of negative things happened that affected us in 2020 and even last year. But one positive thing that came out of it was that now certain types of debt can be reduced and in some cases it can be completely eliminated from your credit. There actually are more options than there ever have been to take control of your debt. So if you do want an option of paying off your debt in a fraction of the time, helping you to save thousands in interest rates, you can complete the 30 second online debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash Kim. Thank you so much PDS Debt for sponsoring this video Okay, now let's get into today's story. Florida, it seems like paradise to many. It can be an escape to a place where every day seems sunny, lined with beautiful beaches, warm blue water, bikini-clad beauties, amusement parks like Disney World, and popular destinations like South Beach. But I'm sure most of you know there's another side of Florida, especially someone like me, a native Floridian. I know the secrets that Florida holds. Some of the worst cases that I've heard about happened in Florida. And today's case is just another one to add to that list. I've always wondered what it is about Florida that makes it such a perfect breeding ground for killers, or do they flock there for some reason? I know I used to be told it's because it's a transient area, there are strangers that pass through, or because there's warm weather. And I'm thinking, why does warm weather invite killers to a beautiful state like Florida? People who have lived in Florida know the truth about it because it's unavoidable to hear about cases every single day. But so many unsuspecting tourists or those looking for a better life decide on Florida because of the great weather. Even though they probably aren't aware, it rains almost every day after the sun shines down. But a lot of us know better. There's a dark reality to Florida. It's the second largest state when it comes to how many murderers they have on death row. Coming in second only to my current hometown, 
California. It's estimated that it takes 13 years for someone on death row to be killed. I can tell you this, being a cop in Florida is a very hard job. It's a very dangerous job and officers choose to do it and put their life on the line every single day. And one of those officers in Florida is Rick Goff. Rick seemed to be fearless. It was like he was made to be a cop. Rick was a tough cop, one that probably would not even wait for backup and would just handle things themselves. Criminals in town that became regular offenders, they knew Rick real well. Rick worked in narcotics when he first started. Not only did he do this job well, but he loved his job. He ended up becoming an undercover officer and he helped track down the worst of the worst. This job offered him a glimpse into some of the most evil monsters that walk not only Florida streets, but this planet. And to do this job successfully, he had to blend in with them to become one of them and gain their trust. Without a doubt, it's scary. Even if you gain these criminals' trust, they can turn on you at any moment, especially if they find out that you're an undercover cop. There's one big reason Rick wouldn't want that to happen. And it's not just because he wouldn't want to get caught in the crossfire. It's because he had a beautiful family that he wanted to protect. Rick has three children with his wife, Sue, Tyler, Amanda, and Denise. Even though he's strong and fearless on the job, he's different when it comes to his home life. He tends to be more of a helicopter parent, paranoid that at any moment, someone could rush through his door to take revenge. Rick and Sue made their home in Englewood, Florida. This is where they had their three children. Their first child was Denise Amber Goff. She was born August 6, 1986. A few years later, after Denise was born, they had Tyler and Amanda. Creating a family gave Rick four more human lives to worry about besides his own. He knew what human beings were capable of. It's hard for any parent, especially when your children start growing up and having lives of their own. You want so badly, and I know this firsthand, to protect your children. We can't always be there every minute to make sure they're okay. His children grew up in a seaside community on Florida's central coast, and they lived the good life, the American dream, a beautiful family, a good paying job, safe neighborhood in the gorgeous sunny state of Florida. Rick remembers when his first child was born. He remembers dropping Denise off at daycare and as tough as he was as a cop, it was really hard letting her go. He even broke down and cried. This happens to parents. They could be really selfish before having children and then all of a sudden, there's this extension of them that they want to protect no matter what. It's so hard for us to give that control to someone else. And knowing all that he knew about the streets, Rick was terrified for his daughter, but he knew he had to let her go and grow into being her own person and grew, she did, into a stable, well-liked, smart, talented high schooler. She played the flute in high school band and she was beautiful. She had dirty blonde hair and these beautiful blue-green eyes and a very lovely, sweet smile. Denise Amber Goff dreamed about becoming a wife and a mom, having a family and a man that she loved, taking care of her children. That was one of her biggest dreams. Denise was very studious in high school. She was the shy, quiet type. She would just put her head down and study. She also had this natural beauty about her. It was like she wasn't fully aware that she was beautiful. She was slim and athletic, 5'2 and about 110 pounds. She wasn't just beautiful on the outside. She was beautiful on the inside as well. She was sweet and kind and generous. During her senior year of high school, Denise started taking classes at a community college nearby. That's when she bumped into Nathan Lee. Nathan was three years older. He was popular. He was good looking. He was the captain of the baseball team. And as they say, opposites do attract. Denise was the one who started their very first conversation. She knew she had to get up the nerve to talk to him or else she would miss her chance. And they end up hitting it off. Nate was very surprised that Denise had made the first move, but he was glad that she did. They just clicked. They were meant to be, they were soulmates. The thing is, they met right before Valentine's Day and their first date was on January 19th. So it's an awkward time to start a relationship. You have this new person in your life. You don't know what's appropriate. You know, do you take them on a date? Do you get them a gift? Nate decided to buy Denise an inexpensive, but very cute heart-shaped ring. And it had a little gemstone in the middle. Though he only spent about $40, it became very special to Denise. She actually never took it off. 
Denise graduated from high school in 2005, and the couple decided to move to Tampa so she could attend college. But then they found out that she was pregnant, and it wasn't planned, but they were extremely happy. Nate ends up proposing to Denise, and they get married. Denise was 19, and Nate was 21. Now, Rick was a bit worried, even a little bit disappointed, that his daughter wasn't going to go to college, but she was an adult. As hard as it was, he had to let go. Denise looked absolutely beautiful at her wedding. Everyone could tell that the couple was truly in love. Denise Amber Goff was now Denise Amber Lee. Even when Denise was given her beautiful new wedding ring, she still wore that special heart-shaped ring that Nate had given her on their very first Valentine's Day. Now, the young couple were not able to afford their own place, so they did move in with Denise's parents, Rick and Sue, until they could find a place of their own in their budget. Little did they know, in just two years' time, the Lees would have two little boys of their own, Noah and Adam, only a year apart. They had created their own beautiful little family. Not having a lot of money wasn't that much of a big deal to them because they knew if they worked hard, everything would work out. And Nate was working hard. He was working three jobs at the time to take care of them and save for their future. They always kept their eye out for a place of their own to rent and they wanted a house and they wanted it to be close enough to their parents to be in touch, but far enough away that it felt like they had their own lives. Finally, they had an opportunity to rent the perfect house at a great price that would be manageable for Nate. It was nice. It was brand new. It was a three bedroom, two bath home in a city called Northport in Sarasota County, Florida. Northport, Florida. Have you heard that before? It might sound familiar to some of you, especially if you keep up with true crime cases, specifically the Gabby Petito case. Northport is where Brian Laundrie's parents' house was located where reporters were camping outside. Northport police was the department that was investigating the crime from Florida, the police department that worked with the FBI, to investigate the swamp for Brian. That's Northport, Florida. That was a town Denise's dad didn't exactly want her to move, and it's not a bad area or anything like that. But back in 2008, the real estate bubble had burst. Subdivisions like the one this house was in was only half finished. The project was abandoned, and that was due to the market crash. So therefore, these houses, they were scattered all over the neighborhood. There would be a house and then a plot of empty land, yards with nothing in it, weeds just growing there, and the neighboring houses weren't exactly close to one another. However, the house that the Lees were looking at did have one house next to it, so they wouldn't be completely alone on their street. Still, Rick was worried. Since that area was not built up, he considered it pretty rural. He thought it was way too far off the beaten path, it was in the middle of nowhere, but that's precisely why they could afford it. I am going to show you additional pictures in just a few minutes to provide more details about how it looked and all of its characteristics. The Lees move in to their new home at 7912 Latour Avenue in Northport. Rick was happy for Denise. He just wished that she had gone a little bit slower in deciding to start a family and living separate from her parents. Rick didn't have the best feeling about all of it. He might have been right because just after they moved in, the Lee family experienced their first run-in with a criminal. Nate's car, which was parked in their driveway, got broken into and valuables were taken. Rick couldn't help but have that I told you so attitude. But of course it made him even more worried about his daughter and her growing family. Denise would typically spend the day alone with the boys while Nate was at work. He found a full-time, good-paying, steady job with Florida Power and Light as an electric meter reader. Nate had to leave for work really early in the morning before the break of dawn while his family was still asleep. It's kind of a good thing because the earlier he got to work, the earlier he would get out. He would normally leave work around 3 p.m. Their house was only a 25-minute drive, so he was usually home before 4 o'clock, and that gave him plenty of time to enjoy his family. The more and more time the Lees spent at their new home, the more they loved it. They actually liked that there weren't a lot of people living nearby. It felt safer to them and you could be as loud as you wanted. No one was complaining. It actually does sound nice to only have one neighbor, only one household that could possibly cause problems. Most of us know how stressful it can be when you're living close to an annoying neighbor. But on the other hand, having only one neighbor meant there was only one person who could help if something went wrong and something was 
going to go wrong for this family. Something you never think is going to happen to your family. Something that seems unbelievable. A story that you think has to be made up, but the frightening thing is the story is real. A normal day for Denise was playing with the children, teaching them things like potty training, taking them on little outings, maybe to the grocery store or the library. There was actually a MySpace post from Denise that she created about what a day in her life was like with two little boys as a young mom. I want to read this to you because it'll give you an idea of the way she thought plus the way that she was feeling just five months before everything changed. It was on Wednesday, August 15th, 2007. She wrote, The joy of having two boys. Today, I thought it might be fun to take the boys to the mall by myself. It started off really well. Noah and I ate lunch in the food court while Adam slept. I let Noah go on one of those rides that cost 75 cents. Then we went to Old Navy. Noah started getting a little hyper and would not stay with me. So I had to hold him and push the stroller at the same time. At the checkout, both of them started crying. Adam was hungry. So we went back to the car where I fed Adam because he's breastfeeding. And Noah played in the car, rolling the windows up and down. Finally, we went back in the mall and I let Noah play in the play area so I could get a chance to just sit down. Noah was knocked down twice by older boys running around wild and of course then Adam needed a diaper change and I couldn't take my eyes off Noah or else he'd run out of the play area. So I put both of them on the changing table and changed both of their diapers. Fun, fun. We went to JCPenney and I was trying on sunglasses when Noah tried to run away. So I had to carry Noah while trying on sunglasses and then Nathan called. Both of the boys start crying at once. So I put Noah down and I picked up Adam. Noah thought it would be funny to run away again. So I caught him while I was holding Adam and put Noah in the stroller. An old man even commented that I had my hands full and he said he checked in the bottom of the basket to make sure I didn't have a third one. LOL, can you imagine if I had three? So I finally bought my sunglasses and we went home. Something so simple as going to the mall to buy new sunglasses is 1000 times harder when you have two boys under two but it was so fun. Anytime I get to leave the house, it's a treat for me. So there you have it. You see how much Denise loved her boys. It was a hard job, but she did it with patience and pride. When it was sunny and bright, Denise and the boys got to enjoy their backyard or the nearby parks a lot. January 17th, 2008 started like any other day for the Lee family. Nate left the house early before Denise had even gotten up. When she did, Denise did her everyday routine with the boys. However, something different was going to happen that day. It was normal for Nate and Denise to speak periodically throughout their day. They would update each other on what they were doing, keep in touch until Nate got home, and he would usually call her around his lunch break, which was no different on January 17th. Nate spoke to Denise at 11.09 a.m. They only talked for about five minutes. Considering that Nate worked for the electric company, they were always trying to cut down on their electric bill. So on this call, he just reminds Denise to open all the windows so that the breeze could come in because it was such a beautiful day. They really didn't want to run the air conditioning and she kind of knew that routine. So she told Nate she had already done it. Then she explained that she was going to go take the boys outside because it was gorgeous. And she was even going to give them a haircut on their lanai. It was super hot the day before and it wasn't comfortable to be outside, so they stayed inside running the AC all day. When it's nice and breezy like it was that day, the fresh air felt really good circulating throughout the house. Now I'm going to show you all the windows in a moment. I just want to point out that the fact Denise had a cop for a father, she was well aware of her surroundings. She knew how to take care of herself, how to stay protected, to be leery of people that you come in contact with. She was smart. But even knowing all of that, there are situations that we can never expect to happen that we can't plan for and we certainly can't control. Her dad had taught her from a young age to think like a cop. She would listen intensely to her dad's advice, the stories he told her about the monsters who walk our streets. Being well aware of these things does come in handy. One step further, she learned all about evidence and DNA and forensics. She actually enjoyed watching shows about true crime she knew if she did find herself in an unfortunate situation, there were ways to make it easier for authorities to help you, to find you, to solve the case. I'm sure that we have those things in mind right now. Worst case scenario, scratch the assailant or leave something unique behind. 
Because if you do go missing or something happens to you, there will be evidence underneath your fingernails or a trail for cops to follow. As morbid as that may sound, in those last moments, it is a clue. It is something that you can do to help solve your case. And we hear about that. Another thing we learn from a very young age is to call 911. We're taught as a child to call for help as soon as we think there's a problem. Denise was brought up to trust law enforcement, to know that they were going to be there to help. We put so much faith into law enforcement and the processes and procedures that have been set in place to save our lives. By the time 2008 rolled around, her father was now a detective and he had been in law enforcement for 25 years in Charlotte County, which is the county that neighbored Northport. Now I told you, I'd show you pictures of Ali's home. It was located at 7912 Latour Avenue. There's just one single home next to theirs, and then there's just trees on that side, hiding the rest of the road from view. They lived on the end of the street where the road curved. And as you can see, you come around the bend here, and here's the Lee's house. There's the Lanai, and it's what most people would refer to as a patio or a porch. It's screened in, and there's a nice size backyard. Possibly later, they would have had it fenced in because it would be kind of scary having kids or your pets outside with the road so close. But at this time, with the subdivision being so empty, cars hardly came down this way. And in the lanai was where Denise would cut the boy's hair out on this patio so she could easily sweep or vacuum it up and she wouldn't have to worry that it would get into their carpet. If a car did come around that bend, you can see right into the screen patio. They could see Denise and the kids, especially if they were going slowly around this curve. Normally looking at this lot, it would be great. Something that has a lot of space in the backyard and even on the side. If you come down Latour Avenue here, you can see this long driveway up to their garage, and then there's a sidewalk to their front door, as well as the windows on the front of the house. There are three that we can see, but as you come into the driveway, you can clearly see the windows, which are going to be of significance, and that's why I'm mentioning it. They had this one neighbor with a house that looks pretty similar, almost the same as theirs. Other than that, there's no one close by. This is what the area looked like in 2011. I was able to get a glimpse inside the home from May 18th, 2008, which was pretty significant to me. This is the same year, just a few months after January 17th. Who knows if this was their furniture, I am not sure, but on the inside, you can see this small kitchen and you can actually see right out this sliding door to the lanai from the living room. There's a tiny kitchenette dining area with two windows. There's also what looks like a bedroom as you pass through the living room, as well as another bedroom right off the kitchen. The inside of the Lee's house was like many parents with small children. There were a mixture of sippy cups and toys on the floor and laundry that needed to be done. Sounds like what my room looks like right now, minus the sippy cup. Now that I've gone into detail about where things unfolded, I wanna discuss who all the characters are the people that will become involved in this story so that you get a good idea of who they are, where they came from, and what their mindset was like. It's very important to me to look at things from everyone's perspective so that it comes together to paint an entire picture with as much clarity as possible. That's the best when you're trying to analyze cases like this one. You see this house to the left of the Lee's house if you're facing it? The only neighbor someone who could see the comings and goings. It's important to talk about who lives in this house and who was there on January 17th. Inside was a teenage girl named Jennifer Eckhart. She didn't live there, but for the past month, she'd been staying with relatives who owned that home. She was from New York and she was visiting her boyfriend who also lived in Northport. The afternoon of January 17th, she was watching TV and waiting for her boyfriend to come over. This was around the same time Denise was cutting the boy's hair in the lanai. Denise had realized the boys needed a trim and she decided to do it herself. One, she wanted to save money, and two, because she could handle the boys better than a stranger. It was also Noah's very first time getting his hair cut and Denise wanted to remember that moment because it was a milestone. Of course, I'm gonna introduce you to more people, but now that I've given you a good perspective on Nate and Denise, where they lived, and who their neighbors were. I wanna go into the day that everything changed and their entire life was turned upside down for reasons we will probably never understand. That day, she was cutting Noah's hair out on the lanai 
and she was trying to go as fast as she could because she knew it was only a matter of time before he wanted to get out of the high chair and run around. It's sad to think if she had just gotten inside a little bit sooner, what happened next might not have happened at all. Something caught her eye on the street. She could hear it before she could see it because the subdivision was so empty. You could hear the echo of a car engine before it even showed up around the bend. It was around 2.15 p.m. She noticed a green car coming around the curve. That wouldn't be that unusual, but remember, not a lot of people lived in this area. Plus, when you're living somewhere, you sort of know who comes and goes. You, you recognize cars and you recognize people. She also knew there was someone visiting next door. She was well aware of Jennifer, so for all she knew, Jennifer could have a friend coming over and she actually was waiting for her boyfriend that day. It wouldn't have seemed that suspicious at first. However, she noticed that the car came by more than once. For a minute, she may have even thought it could be Nate coming home early because he also drove the same color car, but his was a Dodge and this was a Chevy Camaro. But when she first spotted the car, it may not have been apparent. Jennifer spotted the green car as well. She was sitting on the couch and she was watching TV and she got up and looked out the blinds to see if that was her boyfriend because she heard it too. It wasn't. When it came around one more time, she wondered if they were lost. She was thinking maybe they can't find their way out of the subdivision and she was wondering if she should go out there and help them. On the front of the car, she noticed that it had one of those black bras. It's a material that you tie onto the hood and it protects it from getting hit by a whole bunch of flies. If you haven't lived in Florida, it's actually pretty well known that love bugs, that's what they call them, they get almost glued to the front of your car as they die when you're going fast on the highway at a high speed. They're really hard to clean off, so that's why people protect their front bumper. Jennifer just took a mental note because it's not something she was used to seeing back in New York. She noticed the car had driven by probably four times. She told herself, if they drive by again, I'm definitely gonna go out there and figure out what's going on. The last time it came around, it was going really slow. She decided to stick to her plan. She walked outside to attempt to speak to them. That's when the car pulls into Denise's driveway. At this point she thought, okay, this is someone that's clearly looking for Denise's house and they found it. Then she thought, wait, that could be my boyfriend in a different car, like he could be getting dropped off. So she looked over and she could see the driver's seat it was facing her and she could clearly see the driver from her vantage point and she realized, okay, that's not my boyfriend. He was much older, maybe in around his late 30s. He had a beard and blonde looking hair. All of a sudden, he looks over at her. He catches her gaze and it was weird. Not because he was scary looking or ugly or anything like that. It was just the way that he looked over. It made her feel very uncomfortable. She quickly just turned her head and she just went back inside and locked the door. A few minutes later, she returned to the window to look for her boyfriend again. She noticed that the guy was sitting in his car. He hadn't gotten out, he was just sitting there. Considering that Jennifer wasn't a resident of this area, she had no idea what kind of cars came up and down the street. There wasn't a reason for her to think that this would be suspicious, but Sometimes we have a gut feeling, and I think that's what Jennifer was experiencing in that moment. About 15 minutes later, she looks outside once again because she hears the car start. This time, she saw the green car pulling out of Denise's driveway and leaving down the road past the house she was in. He drove right past her on Latour Avenue, and as she's looking at the car, she doesn't notice anyone else in the car but him. She didn't think anything of it. The driver of the car was Michael Lee King. I wouldn't exactly say he was lost in the neighborhood, but he was definitely lost on his path in life. He was struggling. He had just lost his job and he was in the middle of looking for another one. Michael wasn't a bad guy, but he didn't have a perfect childhood. He wouldn't necessarily have said that he had a bad one either, but something that stood out from his childhood was what happened to him when he was only six. Michael grew up in Michigan and everyone called him Mikey. He was a super cute little boy. Him and his siblings were playing in the snow in Michigan one winter. He was on a sled being pulled by a snowmobile that his brother was driving. Mikey was supposed to let go so he could go down the hill, but instead he kept holding onto the rope. And then the most horrible thing happened. He flew right off the sled at a very high speed and his head slammed right into a pole. Everyone thought he was dead. 
They were screaming, they were crying, and they were rushing towards him, and all they saw was the dark red blood in the snow. They rushed him inside, and his head was already starting to swell, and there were no signs of life coming from him at that time. They were in such shock about what had just happened, they probably didn't even notice whether he was breathing. They rushed him right to the hospital, and luckily, they were able to save his life. However, Mikey did change after that. Unfortunately, by the time he made it to the first grade, he was classified as learning impaired. It was a very hard for him to make friends or do well in school, so he became withdrawn. By the time he was in high school, he realized it was too much for him to handle. He dropped out so he could attend a trade school, and he was on track to become a plumber. Now, despite any stigma that surrounds plumbers, they make a pretty good salary, believe it or not. And even though he was a bit slow, so to speak, he was a really good plumber. He landed a full-time, high-paying apprentice job at a well-known plumbing company, and his career advanced from there. Mike even met a woman named Danielle, and they fell in love. They got married and had a son together who they named Matthew, but they would affectionately call Maddie. Unfortunately, they had problems, which led to divorce, and Mike and his son moved to Florida in 2002 so they could be closer to Mike's family. Mike loved his son so much. He noticed that Maddie was a very bright, good student with a lot of friends. Mike knew that his son would do very well and be way better off than himself. A lot of times, Mike would actually ask Maddie for help understanding things, whether it was reading big words or doing a math problem that would help him to rebuild something for his plumbing business. Something else that was different about Mike than most people was that he was a pathological liar but not for the reasons you might have heard before. Mike didn't know how to keep up with other people. So a lot of times, he resorted to lying so that he felt like he was like everybody else. I mean, he would lie about the weirdest things though. For example, he told people that he was a stripper. That's kind of interesting. Or he would lie about being friends with celebrities like Kid Rock. Might not even know who that is, but that was a big celebrity back then, I guess. He'd even lie about taking trips to California when he had never even been there before. The lies would change depending upon what crowd he was with. The lies might have made him feel better, but to the people around him, they knew better than to think that any of these things were even possible. But like many pathological liars, sometimes he would believe his lies or he would even lie about lying. But unlike a lot of, I would say, professional pathological liars, Mike was not a good liar. You would think he would be because he started lying when he was just a little boy. Everyone close to him knew this. They would just put up with it because it was part of his personality. I know a lot of children that play make-believe. They'll make up stories about imaginary friends or things that haven't really happened, and that's because they're dreamers. However, at some point in life, as an adult, it's not really acceptable anymore. What was once classified as innocent now seems really deceitful, it's a terrible character trait. People do not want to be around someone they can't trust. One of his family members, a cousin named Harold, was on the receiving end of a lot of Mike's lies. He would witness Mike trying to impress his friends by talking about how much money he had or the cool cars that he owned, like a big truck that no one would ever see because it was conveniently always in the shop. When his lies would start to catch up to him, he would create more lies. He would say, I crashed the truck or it got stolen. But when I say he lied about things, he actually wasn't lying about having money. He wasn't lying about having a good job. He did have enough money to buy some luxury items. That was true. That was his thing. Buying material possessions and also getting girls. Going out trying to find women was probably one of Mike's biggest hobbies. Him and his wingman, John, they used to do this all the time together. Oh, and women fell for his lies, especially the younger ones, and he liked them young. Recently, he had been seeing a girl that said she was only 15, and she looked it too. Maybe that was a lie, but either way, he had a thing for younger women. And he didn't have a problem getting women. He wouldn't necessarily have long relationships. Most of them were one-night stands, but there were a few women he did have relationships with that lasted longer. Mike would want to go out so bad sometimes, he wouldn't even mind paying for John to come along. He just didn't want to go out alone. They would go to all kinds of places. Sometimes it was strip clubs, other times it was just bars, but Mike had a type. 
long hair, young, slim, petite, tiny, maybe about five feet, two, five feet, three inches tall. And Mike was a pretty cool friend to have. He even bought John a dirt bike just to have John go with him on the weekends. But I kind of thought to myself, it's sort of like you're buying friendship. And once John ended up tying the knot with his girlfriend, Stephanie, he didn't spend as much time with Mike anymore. And guess what? John's wife was Mike's type. She was slim, petite, she had long dark hair, and she was younger than him and John. Mike had no problem hanging out with John and his new wife, and it didn't take long before he started telling her lies about John. He even told Stephanie that John was out cheating with another woman. So of course, she's younger, she looks up to Mike, and she starts crying on his shoulder, and he's comforting her, and this ends up turning into an affair. So now he's cheating with his best friend's wife. This didn't end well. John found out and he put a restraining order on Mike. John and Stephanie then picked up and they moved far away to another state. In 2008, when this story unfolds, Mike was 36 years old. He had blonde hair, which he would lighten with bleach to get it to look this way and big blue piercing eyes. Mike actually dressed really well. And a lot of times when he flashed around enough cash, he would get the ladies to be wrapped around his finger. Actually, a lot of the times these women would go out of their way to flirt with him because he wasn't bad looking, especially because of his eyes. They were captivating. Some ladies probably couldn't care less what color eyes he had because they were attracted to fast cars, money, motorcycles. And he was the type of guy who doted on the girls with gifts and things like that. Mike loved cars. He had several. He had a Corvette, a Mustang, and a Camaro. But it wasn't just about the cars and the good times. Women also like men who have a stable job and are hard workers, and that was Mike. He was smart enough never to get into drugs and alcohol, so when he went out, he wouldn't party with substances. He was there for one reason, to meet the ladies. But deep down inside, Mike actually wanted to settle down. He missed his wife. He wished he could find someone that would be loyal and that he could get along with. He wanted to find his soulmate. It had been 10 years since his divorce and Danielle left him for another man that she met on the internet. So it was really tough. There was another woman finally that he fell deeply in love with and he thought he was gonna spend the rest of his life with her. Her name is Jennifer Robb, not to be confused with the teenager who lived next door to Denise. So I'm gonna be calling Mike's girlfriend, Jen. They had dated for a while, but she dumped him about two months ago after things started to go downhill for him. There was something else that was problematic. Another reason why Jen had trouble with Mike is because he was dealing with some neurological issues that were making it harder and harder for him to function normally. He had tinnitus, and I don't know how much you know about tinnitus or if you know what it is, but people have taken their lives because of it. It's a ringing or a buzzing in your ears and it doesn't stop. It was accompanied by headaches, so he would have these episodes every now and again and they were getting more and more common. They would feed off of each other's energy which would end up getting them in trouble together. I wouldn't necessarily say that Jen was to blame for Mike getting fired, but because he was spending more and more time staying up late and partying with Jen, he started to slip up at work. When things would go wrong at work, he would lie or he would blame it on other people. But it was apparent that Mike was slipping up time and time again, and he would be given another chance. And that's because he was such a hard worker, but then it kept happening over and over again. Eventually, he was starting to become a risk for the company, so they had to let him go. Mike was depressed. He had lost who he thought was the love of his life. He had lost his job. Even his son, someone he had been able to count on, left him. Maddie was now 12 years old and he moved back to Michigan to live with his mom, Danielle. This was just that downward spiral that eventually led Mike to drive by Denise's house on January 17th, 2008, around 2.15 p.m. And that's why I say he wasn't lost that day on Latour Avenue, but he was lost in life. That morning was like any other back at Mike's house at 3493 Sardinia Ave in Northport. His next door neighbor, Dana, saw him pulling out of his driveway and she actually thought to herself, I hope he never comes back and you might be wondering why I know I was when I was reading the story. 
What had he done to this neighbor? Dana Lewis lived with her mom, Oma May Bird. They were from Kentucky. About seven years ago, they decided to move to Northport, and then about six months later, Mike moved in next door to them. Oma's grandson, Austin, used to play with Mike's son, Maddie, and everything seemed to be great. One time when Danielle was visiting Mike with Maddie, she got into an argument with Dana, but they sorted it out and they came to an understanding. But during that conversation, she caught a glimpse inside Mike's world. Danielle told her that he would fly off the handle, except he wouldn't do it with his son, only with Danielle. And then she remembers that Jen was living there as well. Jen had been living there for a while. She, Mike, and Maddie were a family and they would do all kinds of normal things Jen had lived there for a while and she, Mike, and Maddie were like a family. They did normal family things together. But Dana remembers at one point, all the neighbors began competing with one another to see who had better things. And when I say all the neighbors, it was basically three neighbors in this area, mostly Dana and Mike. They wanted to see who had nicer cars, nicer lawns. I'm sure you have heard the phrase, keeping up with the Joneses. That, that's what we're talking about. At first, Dana and Oma thought it was all in good fun. It was just a neighborly thing that Mike was like any other neighbor. There wasn't even anything to complain about. There was nothing wrong with him. He didn't play loud music. He didn't have weirdos like walking around outside the house or anything. But something unusual happened when Dana bought a new Cadillac. It was a really nice one and she had worked hard for it. She definitely didn't purchase it to one-up anyone. This is just something she wanted, but Mike did not see it that way. Before her Cadillac came along, he had the nicest cars on the block. One day, she walks outside to get in her car and she noticed all of her tires were slashed. Not only that, there were eggs all over her car just sizzling in the Florida sun and it was tarnishing her paint. Dana suspected it was Mike. Who else would it have been? Who would do that? Who would care enough to ruin something that Dana owned? So Oma and Dana were convinced that Mike did it because he wanted to be the only one with the nice things. After this incident, he no longer even spoke to them anymore. Then something else happened after Oma decided to have a nice in-ground pool put in, something that she had wanted to do for many years. It was some time after Mike went out and bought his own pool. It was one of those above ground ones. He put it up in the backyard. He invited all the kids over to enjoy it. Well, Oma finally saved up enough to get a pool of her own. And as soon as they were breaking ground and laying down the cement, Mike had to make a comment. Remember her decision to get a pool has nothing to do with him, yet he comes over and he starts telling them, oh, I'm gonna get a pool too. And it's gonna be a bigger one. Once the pool was finished, she saw him staring over as the kids were smiling and laughing and playing and carrying on. They were in this fresh sparkling water, having a good time. And even his son, Maddie, was over taking a swim. But Mike would just stand there giving her dirty looks. And finally, Oma decided to put a fence around their backyard. And she did not do this because of Mike and how close his house was to hers. It was just for safety and privacy. That's all. Well, Mike believed she did it to spite him. Anytime they were swimming, he would run his lawnmower right up next to their new fence. It would spew all these wet blades of grass over the fence. It would stain the wood and all the dust and all the particles and the, the gasoline fumes would be flying over into their yard. So it was really hard to enjoy. He would also never leave his driveway in a civilized manner. This man had to burn and spin his tires every time. But the worst thing that they found was battery acid. It had been thrown all over their pool floats and all their pool supplies and it burned right through everything. They couldn't tell for sure whether it was him or not, but who else would it have been? Oh, he was mean to animals too and that's not okay. They had this tiny little dog and it was out in their yard, not Mike's, and he just didn't like it so he threatened to kill it. This made Dana very upset and she would have words with him all the time and they were not kind words. She would refer to him, her words, as a fat effer. At this point, Oma decides to get cameras and they found out 
that he was shooting BBs at their house, breaking out lights and stuff, and they just thought he went crazy. What was frustrating was that the cops wouldn't do anything. Like in many cases we hear about, Dana just kept asking the cops, how far does this have to go before you will step in? Does somebody have to die for you to do something? Mike had no criminal record and the cops didn't have that much evidence of anything illegal and they wouldn't even watch the videotape. These things just were not high on their list of priorities and they considered his shenanigans just innocent pranks. The cops told Dana, go over there and solve it with him. You guys are adults. Talk to him and find out what the problem is. But to her, it was well beyond that. So what was it about these neighbors that pissed him off so much? Oma said she thought she knew. She thinks that Mike had always been into Dana and since she would not give him the time of day, he wanted revenge. Look, we're never going to know for sure. All we know is that Dana saw him pulling out of his garage that day and just thought to herself, I wish he would go away, never to return. Was her wish about to come true? You're going to find out. It was right before noon and Mike was on his way to the gun range to shoot off a few rounds. Meanwhile, this is when Denise is back at her house going through her normal daily routine. Around 1.30 p.m. following the stop of the gun range, Mike was now doing something a lot of us do. I know I do. He was just driving around, listening to music, getting into his own thoughts. Remember that he is somewhat of a dreamer. But this day, it was almost as though he was in a trance. Since his house was going through that foreclosure, he had packed everything up and he was selling everything. His house was pretty much empty. He was even sleeping on the floor and he didn't really feel like he had anywhere to go or anyone to be with. Mike might have been in that subdivision for the same exact reason the Lees had been there a few months ago, looking for a place nearby with cheap rent. His house was going into foreclosure and he had a lot of debt. And his house was only about 10 minutes away, so it would make sense for him to be looking around in other subdivisions nearby for homes that had the for rent sign up. Going on the theory that Mike could have been looking for a house to rent, something I recognized was that Mike's house had a lot of the same characteristics as the Lees did. They were both three bedrooms, two bath homes with around the same square footage. The roads between Mike's and the Lees were all in residential areas and they were few and far between, which means it wasn't very packed with a lot of houses back to back. So I assume there weren't that many available to rent. So who knows? He may have seen an old listing and thought the Lee's house was still available. So he took a drive to check it out. Look, they both have homes around a bend at the end of the street with only one neighbor on the same side. It has a lanai, similar type kitchen, a window off the kitchen and the living room. It's almost the same setup and the Lee's home may have been cheaper since it was in this underdeveloped neighborhood. Around 2 p.m., Denise starts to cut Noah's hair. She was in such a good mood that day. Her and Nate, they had been talking about possibly having another baby. She actually thought she could be pregnant, so they were waiting to find out about that. And it's just crazy to me how life can change in an instant. You could be minding your own business at your own home in broad daylight. And the next hour, everything changed. She was expecting Nate to call her around three o'clock when he left work as usual to let her know he was coming home. I wanna remind you though that he had called her at 11 o'clock and they talked for just a few minutes and that's when he told her to open all the windows. Remember I told you that there's something significant about those windows? Well, that was the first clue that something was wrong. Before I explain what it was, let's turn to what everyone else was doing during the same time frame. Nate was on his way home around 3.15. Nate called Denise at three o'clock like he always did, but she didn't answer. As a matter of fact, her dad had also called her phone around this time and she didn't answer his call either. He usually made it a point to talk to her by the end of the week because sometimes he'd have to let them borrow some money or he would invite them over to eat because he knew that they would be on their last dime until Nate got paid again. It wasn't that unusual for Rick not to get a hold of her because she was busy with the kids. When Nate couldn't get a hold of Denise though, he called again and again and again. All it would do was go straight to her voicemail. So he called eight times in 20 minutes as he drove home and he was driving 
way faster than usual. He was definitely starting to worry because it was very odd for her not to answer at all. He thought maybe she went out, but then he would have been a little perturbed if she wouldn't have let him know, like at least called him to let him know so he wouldn't worry. Just very unlike her. He wasn't really that concerned until he pulled up to their driveway. The eight missed calls plus the fact that the windows were closed made him feel very uneasy, even though he could see that Denise's car was parked in her usual spot on the driveway. It was the fact that typically when him and Denise decided on something like keeping the windows open all day so that the breeze would come through to make sure it was nice and cool when he came home from work, it would be odd for her to decide against that. So he wondered why she would close all the windows. She knew they were trying to save money and it got hot and sticky and stuffy if they kept them closed. He wasn't upset, he was just confused. But he was even more confused as he stepped inside the house. It was humid and sticky as he assumed it would be, but it was what he heard that concerned him. All he could hear were his kids crying. He kept calling Denise's name over and over again and he's looking around confused about why she's not coming out when he called her. I'm sure a lot of you from watching these types of videos, which by the way, I'm hoping that these stories can help to let us know what to get clued into and what to look for and how to be cautious and how to know when to recognize signs so we can learn to be as conscientious as possible of what's going on around us. Denise being raised the way that she did, she knew her surroundings. She tried to make the very best decisions to keep herself and her family safe at all times. And you know how Mike, he's got this jealous nature. Maybe when he drove by and realized that the home had been rented, he felt upset. He was missing out on chances left and right. Nothing was going his way. And this was just another thing to add to the list. We will never know exactly why Mike was driving in that subdivision, but we do know he spotted Denise. As he was coming around that bend, he would have been able to see her out on the lanai with Noah. Who knows if he even noticed that she had a child out there, but there's no doubt he could see right into the screened area, right at Denise. She was his type, young, slender, and petite. She looked younger than she was, almost like a teen. He was in a low place in life, and maybe monsters like this need to take out their aggression on someone weaker than them. Maybe he was so upset that he wasn't getting what he wanted in life. He felt like taking something that wasn't his. Mike drove around several times. The second to the last time he made his way around Latour Avenue, he was almost at a crawl. You've got to be a heartless person if you see a mother with two young children and have no compassion in your heart to know that you're ripping her away from her children, that you're about to do something so terrible to her. Mike was a father, and though he doesn't stop to think for a second, how would he feel if this was happening to his son or his mother or the mother of his child? What do you think you could have done if you were in Denise's position, confronted with this armed man that's 200 pounds? We know Denise didn't want anything to happen to those babies. So she must have convinced Mike to let her put the boys in the house. She closed all the windows. Why? It could have been Mike, but there are three theories. Tell me which one makes the most sense to you. One, Mike told her to because the babies were screaming and she might have been screaming too. And he didn't want to draw any attention to the home. Two, she did it because it would be an outward signal to Nate that something was wrong. Cleverly leaving behind a message that she did it because she was forced to do it, because she knew it would draw attention and leave a clue behind. Or three, because she was afraid if she left them open, the babies could get out somehow after she was taken. Whatever the reason, someone closed the windows. She knew in that moment what was going to happen. Women know. They know there's probably just one thing that these men want to do to them, or maybe two, if they don't let them live. It would be so terrifying to think you have no control over what's going to happen next. You have no idea what's going to happen. And for Denise, 
thinking about all that plus not wanting anything to happen to her babies. We're never going to know exactly what she said to Mike, but it's apparent that he allowed her to leave the boys behind. Maybe they were going to be too much trouble because the heinous acts that he was about to commit were not ones he wanted to do at Denise's house. Probably because he knew that somebody would be coming back. Her husband. Maybe she said that. Maybe she made a threat. Maybe she told him, my husband will be home any minute. But it was actually true. What's sad is that Nate barely missed Denise as she was put inside Mike's car and abducted by him. It's too bad the neighbor wasn't looking outside at that exact moment that Denise was forced into the back seat at gunpoint. It wasn't until Jennifer heard his car that she made her way back to the window, which we talked about before, and she peered outside. By that time, Mike was already passing in front of her house. She did not see anyone but him in the car, and she did not see him putting anyone into the car. When Nate entered the house around 3.25 p.m. and heard his sons crying, he walked into the room to find them both in the same crib, which was very unusual. He was going room to room and he did not know what to think. He did start taking a mental note of everything he saw and he noticed she had put some clean clothes out as though she was gonna change into them. He saw a high chair on the back of the lanai with hair on the floor and he knew she would have never left the chair out there or the hair. He was certain she would not have left it like that. As he was looking around, he noticed that her purse and her keys and her phone were still there. The front door was locked, so he knew she probably had to make her way through the sliding glass door and out the lanai. In these situations, before you freak out, you try your best to think of reasons why this would be happening. His first thought was maybe she locked herself out. We don't have to wonder exactly what Nate stumbled upon when he got home or the way he felt because we have a 911 call. I'm going to play that for you right now, but I just want you to know there are going to be a few more 911 calls after this. So just bear in mind, you're going to be hearing real calls from people in this case. This one was the first one to come in and it's from Nate at around 3.29 p.m. after realizing Denise wasn't there. Before he called 911, he called Denise's mother and she hadn't heard from Denise either. Now she's racing over there as Nate called the cops. So I'm gonna play that for you now. Northport emergency. Uh, yes, um, I'm at 7912 uh, Tour Avenue. Uh, I just got home from work and my wife, I can't find her. My kids were in the house and I don't know where she is. I've looked every single place and I don't know. Your kids are at home by themselves? Yes. I mean, I don't know. I have no idea. You've never done this before? No, 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 no. I don't know where mommy is. That's terrifying. Absolutely sad and terrifying, especially when he says he can't find mommy. After hanging up with 911, Nate called Rick to let him know the bad news. He says, I can't find Denise. She's missing and Rick's thrown off guard. He couldn't even think. He couldn't believe the words that were coming out of Nate's mouth and he wanted to know exactly what he meant by that. He needed details. How long has she been gone? When was the last time you talked to her? Where could she be? Where have you already looked? This is what Rick did. For over two decades, he tracked people down. He worked on missing persons and he worked with absolute monsters. He wasn't able to connect that this was going to touch so close to home for him. The cops arrived around 345 at Denise's house and of course, we have to keep in mind that spouses or anyone close to the victim or the person that's missing or assumed missing is going to be suspicious. But they could tell after talking to Nate that he was completely distraught. Rick knows he's got to act fast so he immediately calls his chief and he begs him to help them even though this is not his department's jurisdiction. He didn't even have much information. He just knew we have to start looking for her right away and the police force did not hesitate. This was one of their own. At this point, Rick is pressing Nate for more information. He asks, were you guys in a fight? What was she wearing? Nate says, no, we didn't get in a fight. I have no idea what she was wearing. I was at work. The cops start walking around the house trying to see if anything's out of place. 
Nate tells them that everything looks normal except for the fact that Denise is not there and her keys, her car, her purse, and her phone were. She would have never left them. Denise's mom finally shows up and she takes the boys back to her house because it's too much for these little boys to handle. They go to interview one of the only witnesses nearby, which was the teenager next door. She could not believe what she was seeing. She thought there was something peculiar about that man driving that Camaro and to look over and see all those cops next door. It was horrifying. She thought it could be her. It could have been her. Here's an interview that she gave to the news. I was by myself the whole time. So like, I kept thinking it could have been me. You know, if would have stopped here. I came outside and he sat there for, I'd say a good 15 minutes. And so I went back inside and then about 10 minutes later he left. It's hard because you're left feeling like you could have done more. But what could she have done? Called the police and said, there's a suspicious car in a driveway. I mean, again, not on their list of priorities. She was questioned thoroughly by the police. She said she didn't see anyone in the car with that man. The Lee's house became a crime scene faster than they could even call it their official home. The yellow tape was being pulled out and put all around their house. And it was surreal, just unimaginable that this could happen in the blink of an eye. Rick was probably the most taken aback by what was going on. It was like he was in a dream. He had done this time and time again, but this time it was different. He then called the Northport Police Department and he begged them to let him get his own guys to work on the case, even though this wasn't his jurisdiction, but he knew his daughter would not have gone away by herself. That This was definitely a missing person. His team was on it. They sent out canines, they went to all different places around the house, they had helicopters in the sky, and they had teams out there searching for his daughter. That's when they put out a bolo, it's be on the lookout, and they had as many cops as they could from both jurisdictions on the case. Here's what went out on the radio. Ben Bills, approximately 5'2", dirty blonde hair, blue eyes, 110 pounds. Put out a bolo to FHP2, please, for dark green tomorrow. But what they didn't know was Denise was being held captive by her kidnapper. Mike pulled into his own driveway near his empty house where he forced Denise inside. He tied up her wrists. And we will not know how many times this man violated her, but he did in more ways than one and in more areas than one in a very violent manner. Like I explained, Mike's life was out of control. He wasn't getting what he wanted, so he stole what he wanted from an innocent person. The bolo didn't go out until an hour and a half after Denise had been reported missing. And by 6.15, they get another 911 call. We always want to know, or at least I do, how the victim was feeling and what they were thinking, what was going through their mind in these moments. And in this case, and this is what captivated me the most and hurt me the most. We don't have to guess what Denise was going through at this point because the second call came in from Denise herself. This woman had the wherewithal and the bravery to think quickly and steal Mike's cell phone. Denise thought like a cop. Everything she learned from her dad was being put into action that day. She was blindfolded in the back of a car. And she called 911 and somehow concealed the phone in a way that only she could hear the 911 operator. I cannot figure out how in the world she was able to accomplish this. But calling 911 is what we are taught to do. That when we call, they'll know where we are and they will come track our location and save us. With fear in her voice, you are going to hear how she disguised calling 911 by pretending she was talking to Mike. The man who a few hours ago decided to park his car in her driveway and take her from her children. And you will hear how she was desperately begging this 911 operator to help her, trying her hardest to convey her life is on the line without tipping Mike off that she had his phone. It is not the best audio. I did as much as I could to make it as clear as possible, but I will be leaving the captions on the screen. And they may not be 100% accurate. I found them online. It's the best I could get. Okay, I'm gonna play it for you now. 
matter how many times I hear this call it makes me angry every single time honestly the first thing I thought of I just wanted to slap some sense into this 911 operator I apologize for saying that but what were they thinking did they not understand that this woman was in trouble they just keep repeating hello 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 how does that help anyone that is their job to listen I feel like training was not done properly why was it so hard to understand that Denise was in trouble? All they could do was keep saying hello. I understand. This is happening very fast. We're listening to it after the fact. And I understand that maybe the operator didn't understand that Denise wasn't at home, that she was in a car. But she began to make it clear little by little as best as she possibly could. It's clear to me, a person listening that doesn't have any experience being a 911 operator, that this is a person who's in desperate need of help. And they're obviously trying to disguise the call. What angered me the most is the time wasted. She kept saying, all I want is to see my family again. It's obvious to me when she kept saying that and the fact she kept saying, please let me go and where are we going, that she had been taken. And you're hearing music, music, radio, car and the operator on the other line has no idea she's in a vehicle it's absolutely gut-wrenching for me to listen to that call and if you have to i know it's hard but listen to it again after everything i just said i don't know if you heard this but by the end of the call mike realizes his phone is missing i don't even know how she was able to get the phone in the first place but to think she had that phone this is something that many victims never even get a chance to do and that she called the people that she had always been told were there to help. They're there to rescue you. And what hurt me really bad was that she kept telling him she was sorry. Sorry for what? This woman didn't do anything wrong. She had nothing to be sorry for, but it was because she was causing a scene. Who wouldn't? Finally, the operator is getting a clue. She's like, what's your name? Denise is just so smart that she's actually able to conceal cleverly conceal from Mike what she's doing and that she's giving the operator all the information. So now this operator knows her name, figures out that she's on the road, that she's blindfolded, even what her address is. What more could she have needed? All the while you can hear that country music and it's eerie. I don't know for sure, but it sounds like at some point Mike may have stopped the car because at that point at the end, you could really hear Denise talking to the operator without having to conceal it as much. I don't know if he might've been outside the car, bending over looking for his phone or looking for it in the trunk, but it just seems like in that moment, she may have been alone and she's begging for help. And when this operator has the audacity to complain that the music is too loud, I can't believe Denise was actually able to get him to turn it down. That is crazy to me. How long was this call going on? It was like a six minute phone call. Can you imagine? And the operator's like, oh, can you have him turn down the radio? It's still loud, I can't hear you. Can you have him turn it down? Oh, sir, uh, even though you're, you're, you're kidnapping me, do you mind turning down the radio just a, just a smidge? I don't know if you could make out what Mike was upset about, but he's explaining and I've read this and I've gone through the facts that he was planning on letting her go, but that she effed up and we're gonna find out why later. But apparently she had tried to escape and she had screamed to call the police. He said he was gonna let her go, but so many abductors say the same thing and they never do. At this point, you're probably thinking what I was, isn't this enough to track her location? I wanted to mention something I saw in the news a while back and play the video for you. It's unrelated to this case, but it demonstrates how listening is essential for 911 operators and cluing in on things means the difference between life and death. Here's a clip. Sorry again, 911. 
I would like to order a pizza at... You called 911 to order a pizza? Uh, yeah, apartment... This is the wrong number to call for a pizza. No, 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 you're not. I'm getting you now. Is the other guy still there? Yep. I need a large pizza. All right. How about medical? You need medical? No. With pepperoni. Turn your sirens off before you get there. Caller ordered a pizza and agreed with everything I said that there's domestic going on. Other dispatchers that I've talked to would not have picked up on this. They've told me they wouldn't have picked up on this. Some dispatchers uh, may have hung up. We're just trained to listen. Wow. It is incredible that that man was able to determine the woman was concealing her 911 call as a pizza delivery order. He did an amazing job. That wouldn't be true in this case, unfortunately. But as the call ended, they were able to connect the phone to Michael King. But what they couldn't do was trace its exact location because it was a prepaid phone. It did not have the normal GPS that regular phones have, so unfortunately all they could do was locate which towers it was pinging off. At the very least though, they have Mike's address and they send officers over there. Now remember, Denise started her call at 6.14 p.m. and what happens next is unbelievable. Another 911 call comes in. It blows my mind that they had yet another chance, another chance to help this poor woman. Because while Mike is driving down the highway with Denise in his back seat, a woman that's driving next to his vehicle paid attention to the signs that something wasn't right. Instead of minding her own business and passing right by, she called 911. By 6.30, they get the call. The woman making this call is Jane Kowalski. Jane lives in Tampa. She's driving 40 miles to Fort Myers to visit her grandma who has been in need of more supervision as she got older and she's on the phone with her sister, giving her a play-by-play -play when all of this is going on. And what I think is the most interesting thing about Jane and her calling the police is the fact that she's literally working for a company that made the software for 911 emergency dispatch centers around the country. It just seems like the perfect combination of all the things coming together to help locate Denise. It's like the stars were aligning for this woman. She's driving on Highway 41 next to the green Camaro. When she stops at a traffic light, she could literally hear someone screaming, which we know is Denise Amber Lee. She decides in that moment she's got to do something. So what does she do? She does what we're told to do. She calls 911 for help. Even her sister heard the screams and she literally thinks that someone's in Jane's car. That's how loud this was. This was right after Denise had hung up with 911. If you're putting the timeline together, that's when this was occurring. Jane had never heard a scream like this before. She couldn't make out whether it was a little kid or if it was an animal because she couldn't see who was making the noise. You don't want to actually jump to conclusions right away. She got the courage to look over and see what was going on. And the only thing she saw was a man in the driver's seat. She caught his eyes. He looks over at her and their eyes meet. And she tries to turn away because she had given him the look like, what's going on in your car? And the way that he looked back scared her. But as soon as she is turning her head away, something catches her eye and she looks. As she sees a tiny hand come up from over the back seat and that's Denise's hand and she is pounding on the seat in front of her and she's pounding on the window as hard as she could and she knew she had to do something. You don't see this every day. You, you, this is not real. This is in movies. You don't see someone in the back seat of a car pounding on the windows. Mike saw Jane looking at him and you know what he did? He turned around and he pushed Denise's head back down into the back seat. When Jane locked eyes with him, it freaked her out. He was scary looking. You don't know what this person's capable of, but she didn't back down. She was determined to get his license plate number. She was just waiting for him to go forward, but then he wasn't moving. After he realized that Jane saw him, he knew if he passed her, she would get his license plate number. So he slowed down and she tries to slow down to try to be at the same pace. But it was rush hour on a Thursday. There were people honking their horns she was in a lot of traffic. This was a main highway, so she felt she had to speed up. And that's when Mike 
got right behind her. License plates on cars in Florida are not like they are in other states. They don't have license plates on the front of the car. They only have them on the back of the car. So this is probably his way of concealing his license plate. She can't just look in her rear view mirror and get the number. She would have to be behind him. And now Jane realizes he's behind her and he can get her license plate number. She's already on the phone to the 911 operator. So I'm gonna play that for you right now. 911, where's the emergency? Well, I'm on 41 going south and uh, I'm gonna do a cross street right now. I just crossed Chamberlain, I'm on 41 going south. And I was at a stoplight and a man pulled up next to me. And I, like a Camaro, they were screaming in the car. Like screaming, screaming, screaming. And not a happy scream, like get me out of here scream. And banging on the window, oh, like slap. Okay. It's a dark, like Camaro, like uh, in the 90s or early 2000s or something. And I turned to look at him. But I think that he saw me look at him, and I'm not trying to be over dramatic here, but something's going on because he's even going even slower now. The vehicle had a white male, white male driver. I've got everybody hollering at me in just one second. And he's going to turn left on Toledo Blade. He's turning left right now. Do you want me to turn? Try to follow him or? Okay. Does he want her to follow it? Okay. Can you turn? Oh, he just, oh, he just turned on Toledo Blade. I don't know if I can catch up. There's a bunch of traffic and I can't get over. They know she's on the 41. They know she's going south. They know where this man is, that he just turned left on Toledo Blade. And you would think to yourself, how many minutes does it take an operator to route that call and get somebody dispatched? Jane gives the operator her name and her number. And she's thinking, well, of course, they're going to call her back to let her know what happened. She even pulls over and she waits for a while, but she never gets a phone call back. She can't stop thinking about this. Was it a prank? Was it real? Was it fake? You would want to know. What's even more upsetting is that Rick had been listening to the police scanners and he learns that a call had come in from his daughter or who could be his daughter. So the dispatch requests the operator to forward the recording to Rick's email. And you can hear them on the radio saying this. I need that recording ASAP. If you have the voice recording, they'll be sending it by email. When Rick had heard that there was a call, his first instinct was to think it could be a prank. He couldn't believe that it could be his daughter, but he also couldn't believe that someone would do that if they did. It wasn't until he actually heard Denise's voice on the call that he realized that this was happening, that this was true. Absolutely horrific. They are now trying to beat the clock. They're fighting time. They have no idea what's going on, but they do know who this monster is and what car he's driving and his license plate number because they were able to track that information from the phone number. I'm gonna let you know there is yet another call. Yes, another call. The more I hear this, the more frustrated I get because I'm thinking, why isn't anyone on their way? Why isn't anyone already at the scene? This is like a few miles from Denise's home. Well, you're gonna find out one reason in just a moment. But as all of this is going on, another call comes in pretty much at the exact time that Denise's call is coming in. So I'm telling you about this call after Jane's, but it actually coincided with the time that Denise was on the phone with another operator. So they're simultaneously getting these calls. Remember that I told you about Mike's family and how he had a cousin named Harold who he used to lie to all the time? Well, they were pretty close. They both lived in Northport and they would see each other pretty frequently. Well, on that evening, before Denise's 911 call, Mike came over to Harold's unannounced. What he did when he got there and what he asked for when he got there and what Harold saw terrified and horrified him so much that he couldn't keep it a secret. He doesn't call 911 though, like he should have, because he's too afraid, because he has a criminal record and he doesn't want to get involved. But he immediately called his daughter, Sabrina. He lets Sabrina know what had just happened. He tells her that he tried to call 911 by dialing star six seven. And if you're not familiar, it usually blocks your phone number. It used to back in the day, everybody used that. 
but when he tried, it wouldn't go through. So that's why he called Sabrina, so that she would call the police. Meanwhile, Harold is making his way to a payphone to call in an anonymous tip, just in case Sabrina didn't call. Even though Sabrina is only a teenager, she took it upon herself to make that call and do the right thing. So this call's coming in, like I said, around the same time that the call from Denise is coming in. So they're overlapping, and I'm going to play it right now. So it's emergency operator Bonnell. I just got a call from my dad, and his cousin came over his house. He borrowed a shovel and the gas tank with a girl in the car, and she was tied up. And the girl got out of the car, and my dad's cousin went and put her back in the car. What's the cousin's name? Mikey King. Michael King. What's the cousin driving? A green Camaro. Okay, we've been looking for this female. You are just so wonderful to call us and give us this this information, okay? Yeah. I don't know if you caught it, but the operator says they've been looking for this female. That's because they already put in a bolo when the officers left Denise's home. This was after they interviewed the neighbor who said he was driving a green Camaro. We heard that over the radio. Now they're getting more information from Sabrina that... The green Camaro is owned by her dad's cousin, Michael King, and that he pulled up to her dad's driveway asking him for a shovel, a gas can, and something else. And that something else was a flashlight. That is horrifying. To think that Harold would go along with that, that he wouldn't stop his cousin and help this poor woman out because, I don't know if you heard what she said, Denise got out of the car that I was referring to in Denise's 911 call when he said that she effed up. And had she not effed up, he was gonna let her go. Just for a little more context to understand what might have been going on in Harold's mind. When Mike stops, he said, I'm in the middle of mowing my lawn and the lawnmower gave out. It just ran out of gas and now it's stuck in a ditch in my front yard. He asks Harold if he could borrow a flashlight to use to see the lawnmower, a shovel to lift it out, and a gas can to get it started again so we could move it. It actually does sound pretty believable had it not been for the fact that Harold saw Denise in the back seat screaming. I would maybe go so far to say that him not doing anything could have caused what happened next to occur because he had time to stop this. Denise got out of that car somehow and she screamed out to Harold to call the cops. Then he witnesses Michael struggling with Denise and he doesn't help her. He doesn't stop Mike. He doesn't call 911. Not only that, he sees that Denise is tied up. Harold watched Mike push Denise back into the vehicle. He said a part of him just thought it was another one of Mike's crazy girlfriends in a dispute with him. But that's not what he told police when he called him because here's his anonymous call. 911, what's the location of your emergency? Um, it's, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the emergency is exactly, but I think there's somebody that's been taken without their, uh, they don't want to be where they need to be. Uh-huh. And they're in a 95 Green Camaro from Northport somewhere. Okay, how do you know this? I know. Is he going to hurt the girl? Did you, you saw them, though. And what, where was she? Uh, in the car? Was she okay? She didn't look like she wanted to do that. Lawnmower broke down and it's stuck in a ditch. I need gas and a shovel. I turned back around, started walking down there, and he said, Oh, don't worry about it. And he took off. After this call, they put out yet another bolo with the description of the car with the black bra as an additional piece of evidence. The crux of this case has to do with negligence. The absolute negligence that happened here, the dropping the ball in more ways than one. The 911 operator who took Jane's call, failed to route that call properly. And the reason why is because the Northport police were handling the case. Charlotte County, which was the county that Rick worked for, only got involved because Rick asked them to. When Jane was driving on the 41, she had just passed the county line. That line separates Northport from Charlotte County. So her call was routed to Charlotte County not Northport. Still, there should have been a record made and dispatchers notified. There were helicopters in the sky. There were deputies on foot with police dogs and patrol cars, and they were so close that had this opportunity not been missed and this negligence not happened, 
Denise wouldn't be face to face with a monster less than a few miles away from her home. Meanwhile, the police are banging down Mike's door. Here's what the officers are relaying over the radio. I need that house secured, please. If you're real comfortable that there's nobody in that house, go ahead and clear out and secure. Hop and secure are taping it up. I can't imagine the fear that was in Denise's father because he knew how these things turned out. Yet he is trying so hard to hold on to hope that his daughter wouldn't become another statistic. But time was running out. There they were at 3493 Sardinia Avenue, the house that stood still like no one lived there. They kicked down the door of this empty house with their guns out in front of them, going room to room, looking for Denise or any signs that she had been there. Here's the police radio. We do have duct tape wired up in a bedroom with long strands of brown hair. But they did spot something a roll of duct tape. When they enter the master bedroom, you can hear an officer over the radio saying that there was a blanket placed over the window. There was another blanket that was crumbled up on the floor. I'm gonna show it to you on the screen. This is a Winnie the Pooh blanket, probably reminiscent of when his little boy was younger or maybe it came from Denise's house. They collected what they could. They got a hair tie that was laying on the floor, a wad of bunched up duct tape that hair was sticking to and they also got a pillow on a makeshift bed that was placed on the floor, which is what I'm showing you here. When I look at this, I get sickened because this is most likely where Mike carried out his heinous acts on Denise. This was another crime scene. So they began putting the yellow tape around Mike's house. A second scene that they had to search from top to bottom. And Oma and Dana are living right next door. They knew this man could fly off the handle and now they're looking outside as a sea of police cars have their lights flashing and helicopters are above the house and now news stations are getting involved because the word is getting out. As much doubt as Rick had in his mind, him and Nate were still hoping for the best and everyone was hoping for the best and Nate, as much doubt as Rick had in his mind, he was still holding out hope. Him and Nate were hoping for the best and everybody was hoping for the best. Because of the sheer amount of people that were helping, Nate really thought they were gonna find her. These investigators were not leaving any stone unturned. They were cutting up pieces of the carpet. They were collecting hair ties, the blanket, the duct tape. I think to myself, she was leaving behind clues. That's what we're told to do, leave something behind. I don't know if you're thinking the same thing I was, but I was like, why are they not on Toledo Blade at this point? That was the road that Jane said the car turned down. Why are they not there? Well, you know why they're not there? They didn't find out about that 911 call till two days later. They would have been able to get there in a matter of minutes, if not seconds. There were 70 units in position at different checkpoints all over Northport and beyond. They had positioned a lot of the patrol cars on I-75, which was one of the largest highways in the area. This is because there are on-ramps and off-ramps and they wanted to make sure they knew every car that was coming in and out. It wasn't until 9.15 p.m., so you do the math. The call from Jane came in around 6.30. It's now 9.15. So Mike has had about three hours to himself and to his deeds. Three more hours with Denise. And I just keep thinking, what happened in those three hours? There were two officers that were parked on a median, one facing one way, one facing the other way, and they were kind of butted up against one another watching the ramps. One of those highway patrolmen was Eddie Pope. Oh, when I read this, I, I got so upset, but they were right near Toledo Blade. And all of a sudden, around 9.15, they notice a car, it's coming off a side road onto Toledo Blade and then coming on the highway. Eddie Pope recognized it was a dark colored Camaro and it entered I-75 South. Now you're going to hear from the police radio a call that comes in to dispatch. Northport 230. Yeah, we're on Toledo Blade now, we're 51. 180, 51. We're at 15, right. Get a green Camaro heading 41 southbound. I swung around on it, I'm sitting on the air. As highway patrolman Pope follows this car, he realizes 
that the license plate matches. He explains it better, but it's this chilling feeling that you get. It's this feeling of adrenaline because you know that this is your guy, but you're also terrified. You don't know what this person's capable of. Traffic stops are some of the most, if not the most dangerous encounters that police can have. He put on his lights, not knowing what was gonna happen, and he tries pulling the Camaro over. Right away, Pope could see that there was only one person in the car, no Denise, from what he could see. He wasn't gonna take a chance either. He grabbed his pistol, opened his car door, and then he took cover behind it. And he asked the driver to put up their hands and get out of the vehicle. Then he sees the figure with his legs coming out of the car and Pope is ready to shoot because he has no idea what's gonna happen. He has no idea what's going on. Just like he's taught to do, he orders the man to walk to the back of his own vehicle and put his hands up. That way he's not near his car. Mike can't go back, operate his car and leave. You're putting space between the driver and their ability to leave the scene. That's exactly why police officers do this. And as soon as Pope came closer with his pistol raised, Mike said he wanted a lawyer. That was the first thing that came out of his mouth. He says, I want a lawyer. Pope wastes no time. He handcuffs him and throws him against the car and starts pressing him about where Denise is. He's screaming at him, where's the fucking girl? And Mike keeps repeating, I want a lawyer. But Pope doesn't let up. He just keeps screaming, listen to me, where is the effing girl. And this is when Mike says that he had been hijacked. His car had been hijacked. Do you really think that this officer believed him? No. It wasn't hard to tell that Mike had been somewhere doing something because his jeans were soaking wet and they had dirt all over them up to his waist and there was mud on his shoes. I'm sure you know where this is going, but Pope pats him down trying to make sure he has no weapon on him and he finds a wallet and a cell phone and the cell phone no longer has a battery in it or a SIM card. So between the 911 call and now, Mike at the very least had suspicions that either his cell phone had been used or it was being tracked. They don't waste any time. They begin to search his vehicle from top to bottom and they did find things, but they didn't find Denise. She was nowhere to be found. They found the gas can, which was now laying on the passenger side of the car on the floor. They find the shovel and they see it's been used because it still has wet dirt on it on the tip. It's lying in the back seat along with the flashlight and blankets. They might not have known where Denise was, but they definitely knew that she was in the car because she left clues behind. They continued to examine his vehicle and they saw blood. Their flashlights could tell there was a substance on the outside of his car on the hood and on the black bra. And as they examined the car closer, they noticed another liquid that was running down the hood of the car. It was some kind of thick, clear liquid along with hair. And they also found hair in the back of the vehicle. These were not good signs. Any experienced law enforcement officer knows that these are signs that they've missed their chance to save someone. Can you believe that Mike maintained the story that he was kidnapped? When they took him to the station, he wouldn't quit. He was just telling another one of his lies, but trust me, these investigators were not falling for his bullshit. His story was that some guy and Denise had hijacked him at gunpoint. They got into his car and they told him to drive. He said that they put some kind of covering over his head and they tied him up and they just took off. Oh, and he wasn't able to hear anything. No, he couldn't hear what the girl said or he could hardly hear her screaming because the hijacker took his time to shove earplugs into Mike's ears. Of course, the investigators are pressing him and telling him things like, listen, we need to find her. She's got two babies at home. I'm here because I, I need to find out to you what, what happened. You're the only person right now that can tell us what happened. We need to find where she is and we need to know, find out from you what was going on. No, I just want to turn the investigator even asked him, where should we start looking? Where did all of this take place? And Mike says, you know what? You should probably go and look close to my house because that's where it initially took place. And isn't it interesting? He's telling the story and turning it on himself because he did that to Denise. He took her from her driveway. He put a blindfold on her. He held her at gunpoint and pushed her into his car. The investigators were already on Toledo Blade and everything around it since that was the road that he came from. It's getting late at this point. 
but they're doing the best they can. They have professional divers in the swamps, helicopters still above, dogs on the ground, but it's getting dark. And they knew they weren't going to be able to continue. They had to end the search because it was also starting to rain. However, that night wasn't over for Mike. They were continuing to press him. He says the man took them out of the car and made them walk into a dark area and that they were both tied up. He just keeps going on and on and on. I would, oh, this would bother me so bad. Seven hours after Denise was kidnapped, canines made a hit on some disturbed dirt. It was very close to where Michael was apprehended and it happened at the end of the night. So like I said, they knew they were not going to be able to continue. One of the dogs had run off right when they were pulling everything back in and the dog went into the woods and started to alert on this spot. As much as they wanted to look right away, they did not have enough light or resources to break ground that night, so they had to wait till the next day. Meanwhile, Mike's ex-girlfriend, Jen, is being questioned. She cannot believe what they're telling her, that she couldn't imagine he would do something like this, but that he did have problems. She told them about the injury when he was younger and the things that had been happening recently. She said sometimes he would have off days and he wouldn't be like himself and he was super depressed lately, but none of that gave her any reason to believe that he would do this. The next morning, Friday, January 18th, right after daybreak, investigators resumed the search. They targeted that area of interest from the night before. It was on Plantation Boulevard off I-75 and near another street called Panacea. I'm gonna to try to show it to you here on the screen. This is the approximate vicinity of where it was. However, I do have an overhead shot of where they were doing the investigation of this area, and you can see it right here. There were cops on horseback, there were canines sniffing the woods, helicopters, divers in the pond, they had people on boats, and they even had thermal imaging, everything and anything. Can you imagine the sadness that Denise's mother and father were feeling? Her mother, Sue, caring for her two grandchildren? while she's waiting to find out what's gonna happen. I would be a wreck. And police were interviewing them as well and showing them pictures of Michael and asking, do you know him? Does he look familiar? And neither one of them knew who he was and they had never seen him before. The thought has to cross your mind that you're never gonna see your kid again. Rick knew in his heart they probably were not going to find Denise alive. And I think this is when you resign yourself to just wanting their body back. You just. You want to be able to know that they're home safely. Even if you never get the chance to speak to them again or look in their eyes like you did before and have them look back at you because they're just a shell of who they were, you still want them back. You don't want to imagine your child cold and lonely even though you know they can't feel that but you can feel it. You can imagine just laying there by yourself. That is not the grave you want for someone you love. The word was getting out regarding Denise's disappearance. News stations were reporting on it, and as Jane was drinking her morning coffee, she sees it on the news. All she could think was, oh my God. She sees Mike's picture. She's like, that's him. She calls the number on the screen to provide a tip, and when she spoke to the authorities, she told them about her 911 call. Nobody knew what she was talking about. It's frustrating because she said, I told you, I told you about Toledo Blade at 6.30 yesterday. Why haven't you found her? I saw her. They acted like they didn't even want to talk to Jane. They gave her the whole, ma'am, you know, we'll, we'll get back to you. I think at this point, they knew that they had messed up. They had enough evidence to charge Mike with kidnapping, so they did lock him up and they were still interrogating him. They put him in a cell with a guy named Charlie. And it turns out that he's somewhat of an informant. Sometimes when people get locked up, they tend to relate to the other criminals there and then they start to share and confess what they did. Many inmates though are trying to get information because if you snitch, you can sometimes reduce your sentence. So that gives them an incentive to try to get information. So this is Charlie's experience with Mike. He hears him saying over and over again, I don't wanna get effed in jail. I don't wanna get effed by a gang in jail. All he's caring about is himself. Charlie knew everything that was happening because he could hear it on the police radios. The whole time everything's going on, he's getting a play-by-play -play and he's trying to get Mike to talk. Mike keeps telling Charlie that the cops are against him, that they're just trying to set him up because they can't find the other guy and it's all a conspiracy and he has nothing to do with it. 
Now he changes his story and says, I was just driving down I-75, minding my own business, and I see this guy on the side of the road and I wanna help him because he's in trouble. So I pull over and then all of a sudden, he shoves him in the back seat and then he puts a girl back there, but he doesn't know what happened to her. What? <laughs> what? Like that doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Charlie's like, dude, you're a 200 pound man. How big was the guy? You couldn't do anything? And Mike's like, no, I was scared that he was gonna shoot me. Mike is trying to cover his tracks. So he says that the hijacker is just driving around some neighborhood in Mike's car. Mike knows everything. So he's trying to figure out a way he can spin the story. Charlie keeps questioning him saying, what do you mean he's driving around a neighborhood? Mike's like, yeah, he's just driving around the neighborhood in circles. Charlie goes, if you had a hood over your head, how do you know that? How do you know where he was? How do you know where he was driving? And Charlie's getting frustrated. And he finally says, listen, dude, somebody saw you with the blonde girl. You were driving a car. Mike is like, what are you talking about? And Charlie admits he overheard everything when Mike was being booked, that the girl had called 911. She talked to the operator. They knew her name. They knew his voice and they tracked his phone to him. They were in his house. Apparently Mike didn't know any of this, but he especially didn't know that Denise had actually reached 911 and he gets quiet. His mood flips. He's getting nervous. He says, wait, what? What do you mean? Charlie says what we would probably say, that we watch a lot of forensic shows and they're going to be finding everything. He says they're going to get your DNA. They're going to use luminol. They're going to see blood you left behind, your semen, your saliva. And he looks right at Mike and he says, they're going to get you. They're going to get you, man. It's over. Mike's quiet for a while and then he wants to know everything about this 911 call because he's already trying to sew together another lie. He tells Charlie that the hijacker was on the phone the whole time. It was the hijacker. He's like, yeah, hijacker was on the phone now that I think of it the whole time. That was the hijacker. I'm not funny in these videos. These are serious videos. I don't try to make jokes, but this is laughable. It gets more idiotic. Mike tells Charlie, I can't. Mike tells Charlie the hijacker made Mike take off his shoes and then the hijacker put Mike's shoes on so that Mike's footprints would be everywhere to frame him for anything that was going to happen. Come on. It's not even a good story. It's a good idea, but it's not a good story. What's he going to say when they find his semen? Is he going to say that the hijacker hijacked his eggplant too? And Mike, all the while, is pretending he cared about Denise that he was the one that was trying to help her escape. He even says, gosh, you know, I hope she's okay. I, I hope they find her and that's sickening. Mike's court appointed attorney walks in and Charlie was eavesdropping and the attorney tries to persuade Mike to tell him where Denise was. He says, this is your last chance to get life in prison instead of getting the electric chair. But he maintained his story that he was taken. At this point, they bring in his cousin Harold to try to get information from Mike, but he wouldn't budge and here is part of that conversation. It's not much, but at the very least, you'll be able to see Mike's demeanor. I am not marrying a husband, like I told you. I couldn't, I tried to put 911 on the phone and everything. So he's sitting there telling his cousin the same story that they hijacked his car and he tried to call 911. They knew he wasn't going to give them any information. I'm preparing myself. This is when the sad part of the story has to be told and it's the part that I hate telling, but it's the part that always has to be told so that we can reveal what these monsters are like. When investigators returned to the site of interest, they noticed an area in a marshy field where the ground looked disturbed. According to the appellate brief, in the vicinity of the disturbed area, there were two small piles of sand that were out of place for normal terrain. In those piles of sand, there was what appeared to be blood. It had appeared that the blood had been on the ground first and then sand had been put on top of it because the sand had absorbed the blood. A forensic team started the excavation of the disturbed area on the morning of January 19th. As they removed the dirt, they noticed scalloped marks, which were consistent with a round nose shovel digging straight into the earth. At the depth of three feet, one inch, they discovered the nude body of Denise Amber Lee lying on her side in the fetal position with a gunshot wound right above her right brow. He said there was also water in the bottom of the hole. And because her body was in the water, 
and it was in an area that was away from the sunlight. It kept her body cold, so she was very well preserved. It, it just looked like she had been sleeping and she had just been placed there. A couple days later, they did find a single nine millimeter shell casing and it was in the grass near the grave site. The actual bullet though was never found. A couple hundred feet away from the grave, a crime scene technician recovered a pair of boxers that belonged to Nathan and Denise wore them a lot. And they also found a shirt that belonged to Denise. The boxers were tested for semen and it was positive and the cells matched the DNA of Michael King. <sighs> Since it was so close to her right eye, this led the medical examiners to conclude that the gun would have been seen by Denise. It would have been right in her field of vision. Now this part is something that really disturbed me. I had never heard of anything like this before, if none of this has been disturbing enough. But from the location of the wound, the medical examiner explained that when the weapon was discharged, it caused Denise's eye to explode. And that thick, translucent substance that was located on the bra of the Camaro, that was most likely her ocular fluid. And like I said, I had never heard about that in any other case. There was also aspirated blood in her lungs, which means that she continued to breathe after her wound was inflicted. Two pieces of duct tape were removed from her hair. The medical examiners found bruises on her wrists and concluded that they had been caused by ligatures and some of them were defensive wounds. Her bra was torn and it was buried nearby and there were bruises on her thighs. I am not going to go into details about the other parts of her body that we know were traumatized in the non-consensual event that occurred, but semen was recovered and it matched Michael's to the exclusion of one quadrillion other Caucasian men. No question, he did this. It's terrifying to think that this woman was in her own home in the daytime with her children, innocently living her life. It wouldn't matter and it definitely wouldn't change anything, but I want so badly to know what was going through Michael's head. Before the end of this video, there is more that I need to say because I can't leave it like this. I wanna celebrate how smart Denise was, the signs that she left behind, the evidence that she purposely planted to aid in the discovery of her identity in case she didn't make it. I'm sure she knew deep down inside that her father was going to do whatever it took to solve this case and she helped. They found strands of her hair that were stuffed underneath the seats of the car and she pulled them out, keeping the root intact so they would have DNA to collect. There was something else. When the cop's flashlight shined through the dark vehicle's back seat, something caught his eye. The light reflected off something shiny and small Within the blanket in the back seat was a tiny heart-shaped ring. And you and I both know it's Denise's ring because we know she was in that vehicle. We know she was in that back seat fighting for her life. We know that. In her last moments, dealing with everything else she was dealing with, she purposely removed the heart-shaped ring that she never took off. The special ring Nate gave her on their very first Valentine's Day together. She took it and she placed it underneath the blanket in a crevice on the driver's side back seat. And I'm showing you the picture if you wanna take a look. She left it behind as a sign that she had been there. And it's so sad for me to think that in her last moments, she was making sure to do as much as she could so that this disgusting man was held accountable for what he did to her. When they found this ring, they had to have someone identify it. And that's when Nate's worst nightmare became a reality that he would never be able to shake. He came down to the police station and he had to confirm that the ring belonged to his beloved wife, Denise. He knew she never took that ring off and he knew what it meant to her. It meant more to her than her wedding ring. Some part of him knew that um, she knew if she would have left her wedding ring behind, he might not have been able to identify it as much as he was able to identify the heart ring. Denise just knew that. And it's actually really gut-wrenching to hear this, but I am gonna play the clip of when he was identifying the ring. Can you go ahead and describe her jewelry? She had a, a heart necklace with a stone in it. Her wedding ring was white gold, and she also had a silver heart ring. That was the first ring I gave her. Is, is this her ring? Yes. 
We know Mike did this, so what happened to him? I don't like to end these stories until we talk about what happened to the person who carried out these horrific crimes, what he was charged with, and ultimately what sentence he received. There were a lot of witnesses for this trial. There were doctors who came in, talked about his head injuries and that, you know, he had a learning disability and what his mental state was like and the symptoms he was having, the headaches, the buzzing in his ears, the stress he was under. They had explained his relationship was falling apart, his house was being foreclosed on, he was unemployed. But these things happen to people on an everyday basis. It's no excuse for hurting an innocent person. His ex-girlfriend came in and she talked about only two days before the crime occurred, Mike's behavior became more extreme. He believed that the neighbors were looking through his windows and he was becoming even more paranoid. He thought people were following him and it was only a matter of time before they caught him. Sometimes I think anytime I hear paranoia, I think schizophrenia, but uh, that's not what we're talking about here. The doctors who examined him concluded that it was actually frontal lobe damage. They found that he had abnormalities in the frontal lobe and they concluded that the abnormal activity was consistent with traumatic brain injury. There was also a, a weird divot in his brain in that area, probably from his accident. The defense tried to argue he was in a catatonic state when this happened, but to me, I'm sitting here thinking, you're in a catatonic state, but you're able to look at a woman you don't know, go into her home, kidnap her, let her sons be put inside of a crib, take her back to your house, do unconsensual things to her, tie her up, drive to your cousin's house, all in a daze? All in a catatonic state? I find that very hard to believe. We usually want to know, why did this happen? We don't want to think that these things can happen at random. We want to find a connection. Some people say it was because one of her family members was a mortgage broker and Mike's house was being foreclosed on, so he was trying to get revenge. Another person came forward and said it was because Rick had a past as an undercover cop and this was a hit. I don't know about that because why would you have to do all those other things? If it was a hit, why not just end her in the house? But the most logical one that people really did believe, but it was debunked by Denise's family, was a man who called in to say he was at the post office in Northport. It was just a couple hours before Denise went missing. He said she was standing behind him in line and so was Mike. And Mike was looking at her as she was coming through the door with a box. When she left, he saw Mike leave and assumed that Mike followed her back to her house. But at the trial, they concluded that this was a random act, that he randomly drove by, he saw her, and in the blink of an eye, he premeditated what he was going to do next as he sat in her driveway. His ex-girlfriend even testified that on that night between 4 and 6 p.m., this was after he had taken Denise, but before he had killed her, that she talked to him on the phone and he sounded completely normal. That is really cold. In the end though, they did not think that he was incapable of understanding right from wrong, especially with how disgusting and heinous this crime was, just how atrocious and cruel it had been. And the judge sentenced him to death. I'm gonna let you hear that clip real fast so that you know exactly what happened? Of Denise Amber Lee, the defendant, is sentenced to be put to death in the manner prescribed by law. There were two victim impact statements by her dad and Nate, and I couldn't find those, but I did find them being interviewed after the trial. She's the most amazing person I've ever known, and I want to thank her for being an amazing wife and an amazing mom to our kids. Not only that, the jury was able to hear all of those 911 calls in their entirety, but the most riveting one was definitely the one by Denise herself. Uh, her, we'd still be looking for her. We'd still be looking for him. Um, she's the one who turned us on to him direct from the beginning with her 911 call. I'm ending this, but one last thing that made this case different than many others was the negligence of the 911 operators and Nathan Lee filed a wrongful death suit against Charlotte County Police Department. That's the same police department that Denise's dad worked for. The lawsuit was based upon what happened to Jane's 911 call. And here's Nate's perspective. There's not a doubt in my mind Denise would still be here. Not a doubt in my mind. Now the sheriff of Charlotte County PD, John Davenport, 
he didn't see it this way. And he made his own public statement regarding his perspective. The assumption is that Charlotte County screwed up and could have saved this girl's life. That's what everybody's thinking. And I'm, t and I'm telling you that until the facts come out here, that's, a, that's the wrong assumption to make. I personally can't really stomach the fact that he kept referring to her as this girl. That's a fellow officer's daughter. Her name is Denise Amber Lee. Nate disagreed, and so did Rick. I'll play that clip for you. If you have heard Ms. Kowalski's call, you heard severe incompetence. That is unacceptable. I mean, I hate to say that the sheriff's office is responsible for my wife's death because, you know, they didn't pull the trigger, but they could have stopped it. But again, the sheriff publicly defended his choices. Was it a missed opportunity? Certainly it was. Would it have changed the outcome? We'll never know. I don't think it would have because we had officers in that area looking for the green Camaro. They didn't find it. It didn't matter what the sheriff thought anyway. There was ample evidence presented at trial that was not in the police department's favor. When Jane's 911 call came in, deputies from Charlotte County were on the exact road Jane was calling from. One deputy took the stand and said under oath that he was parked on the side of Toledo Blade at 6.35 p.m. He could have been behind Mike in mere minutes had that call been dispatched. During the trial, the 911 operator testified, I want you to listen and possibly give me your thoughts on what she said happened. What was the first information you received that day about Denise Amberley? In the afternoon, we were advised that um, Denise Lee had, had been kidnapped and we were given a description of uh, Mr. King and his vehicle. Sitting in the call taker position, can you dispatch a call? No, ma'am. Why not? I don't have a radio. Everybody was talking in loud voices. We had, we had a supervisor that was trying to patch our radio frequencies with Northport radio frequencies. We have a dispatcher that believes her radio isn't working at the time. She's standing next to Liz giving Liz verbal information I thought that I'm giving her. We have Liz on the radio with I don't know how many officers speaking to her. What do you think? Was there evidence that had this call been routed in the correct manner, they would have found Denise in time? How do you feel about the fact that she's a 16-year veteran, that there was evidence she did make the connection between Jane's call and Denise's case. The defense attorney argues, and you'll hear him in a second, that the blame shouldn't be transferred. In spite of what Mr. Boyle has told you, it's about transferring responsibility. Transferring responsibility to the sheriff, that the sheriff should pay for what Michael King did. I understand what he's saying, Michael King is the reason why Denise is dead, but you can't just leave it at that because there's intervening causes to look at. And that was the negligence in this case. You have to hold someone accountable for that. The professional process was not followed in this case. We know that because Nate won the lawsuit. He also started a foundation called the Denise Amber Lee Foundation, and I'm gonna put it up on my screen. Its mission is to standardize training for 911 dispatchers in all 50 states to ensure that emergency services always receive those calls. He never wants what happened to Denise to happen again. Denise's dad advocated for a new law, the Denise Amber Lee Law. It standardized training for all 911 call operators and it was put into place. And here he is in front of the court. We had cars on the road waiting to appre apprehend the guy right where she was at. But uh, they never dispatched the car. On behalf of my daughter, I'd like to see this bill passed. And they did sign that into effect. Okay, I promise this is the last part of the video, but I know you guys like details. Rick weighed in on the Gabby Petito case since it was in Northport, and it included some alleged negligence regarding the Northport police and the fact that they mistook Brian's mom for Brian. And due to this huge mistake, they didn't follow him off the premises and he got away. Here's Denise's dad with his perspective. So why weren't investigators keeping an eye on Brian? Well, we're getting some insight from a family who also lost a loved one. Uh, we didn't know where she was at because she was kidnapped and was able to dial 911. There was a little failure in the system because uh, 911 hung up on a person trying to help her. That's the biggest thing you want to, an answer to it one way or the other. 
And even when we found Denise, it's still not closure because you want to, you never have closure on it completely. Warport's just doing what they're asked to do by the FBI. They can't, they can't step on the FBI's toes because the crime happened out there. They're just being an, what we call an agency assist. So where's Nate and his boys now? Nate tried very hard to heal and he actually thought he would never be able to love again. As a single dad, he did his best to give his boys as much love as he could. But finally he did meet a woman named Tanya and he let her into his heart and they fell in love. They're now married and he says it's still hard for him. The memories of Denise will never leave him. He even worries if Tanya doesn't answer the phone because it brings back the terrifying moments when he couldn't find Denise. We put our faith and trust in our instincts and our knowledge and even our personal experiences to help us in times of danger. Sometimes that's not enough. So we rely on professionals whose job it is to help us when we can't help ourselves. Denise did all the right things. She did everything she could, then handed the baton to the system she believed in her entire life, banking on the heroes in blue to rescue her in the nick of time. She never got a chance to know the truth, that her father hadn't failed her, that he is still a hero. The system failed and they ran out of time. Thank you so much for watching in another one of my videos. I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate you listening to my sponsors and being a part of my journey. I also appreciate all your case requests. I'm trying to get through them and I'm thankful that I have this opportunity to tell you these stories. So thank you so much once again and I will see you in my next video.